So uh, welcome to the second uh, panel of this morning, uh, which will deal with neurophenomenology. What it is, uh, is it useful, uh, why we bother? And uh, the moderator for this uh, panel will be Yoshio uh, Nakamura. He's uh, with you now. Okay, so... Um, I mean, slide Oh, okay. So I'm going to introduce uh, three panelists, uh, all at once at the beginning. So we have three panelists uh, as shown here, Michael Abib, God, uh, Gordon Graham, and Sarah Robinson. So I'll start with Michael. So uh, Michael Abib's book, first book, Brain and Machine and Mathematics, served as the basis for diverse contribution to Mathematical theory of computation, brain theory, robotics, schema theory, as a bridge between cognition and the neural network, neurolinguistics, and language evolution. Michael covers lots of different areas. In 1983, he delivered a Guilford lecture in natural theology at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which resulted in a book called Construction of Reality with philosopher and historian of science, Mary Hesse, extending schema theory to embrace, embrace social schemas and then debate the reality of God. Since 2010, uh, he, he has uh, related his work to architecture and recently uh, he uh, has published his uh, book called uh, Fem Brain Meets Buildings, a conversation between neuroscience and architecture uh, which was published in 2021. Okay, moving on to um, Gordon. Gordon Graham is the chair of Edinburgh's Sacred Arts Foundation, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Arts at the Princeton Theological Seminary in the USA, and the fellow of um, Royal Society of Edinburgh, a Scotland's pre premier academia of science and letters. He taught philosophy at the University of St. Andrews, and he was a, a religious professor of moral philosophy at the University of Aberdeen from 1996 to 2006. He has published extensively on a wide range of philosophical topics. And his books include uh, Philosophy of Art, third edition, which was published in 2005, Re-Enchantment of the World, uh, Philosophy and Art and Religion, 2007 and the 2017 book. So last panelist, Sarah Robinson, is an architect, writer, educator. Her books, Nesting, Body and the Dwelling Mind, 2011, Minding Architecture, Neuroscience, Embodiment, and the Future of Design. Uh, and then her most recent book is titled, Architecture is a Barb. And they are the, among the first work to engage dialogue between architecture and the cognitive sciences. She was the founding president of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, Board of Governors, and she is an adjunct professor in architecture, design, media technology at the Arborg University in Denmark. And she teaches and is a member of the scientific board of NAAD, uh, Neuroscience Applied to Architecture Design at the uh, IUAB uh, in Venice. So, and I'm Yoshio Nakamura. Uh, I'm standing here in front of you as a moderator for this panel. Uh, I was trained as a cognitive psychologist at UC San Diego. And I did the um, emotion postdoc fellowship after that. And then I got into pain research. And I'm still in pain research and so. For the last 15 years or so, I've been working in the field of so-called mind and body intervention research, which means you are looking at the sort of mind or training mind, how it affects sort of a physical condition like a chronic pain and other mental health conditions and so on. And then uh, I'm uh, most interested in uh, looking at the non-dual state of mind, non-dual state of awareness, that can result from 
meditative or contemplative training. And that's the most uh, interesting topic to me. And hopefully, maybe not necessarily during this panel, but we'll have a chance to talk about that. So, does this, this one? Yes, no. Okay. Yeah. So, what is a neurophenomenology? Well, it's a neuroscience plus phenomenology. But in this plus sign, what does this plus sign represent and signify? So that's the question I have to uh, resolve. So then uh, I have a fortune of uh, presenting you a five minute crash course on uh, phenomenology and neurophenomenology. Okay, so bear with me. And it goes quickly, but my intention is not to derail on any detail, but to give you a sort of framework that we can all share. And then we have a plenty of room to disagree. So the idea of phenomenology started from this guy, Edmund Husser. He looks pretty serious, right? <laughs> but anyway, his sort of overarching aim was very ambitious to lay the foundation of, for the sciences by showing how its theoretical constructs are rooted in a broad field of experience. And the important point here is basic definition. Phenomenology is a descriptive study of conscious experience, okay? So that's the definition, basic definition offered by Husserl. <laughs> and by the way, I have taken these three slides from lecture given, given by uh, Philip Browning for the core in action program, semester two, Embodied Mind, part one, session two. And it was done on March 8th, 2023, about uh, you know two weeks ago. And uh, without him, I wouldn't be telling you, but I'm going <laughs> to tell you. So, and I actually listened to this lecture, and it's a good place to start if you want to get the kind of crash course in two hours. But phenomenology is about. Okay, <laughs> but I usually speak too loud. So, <laughs> anyway, going to this. So this is the picture, a well-known picture by Asia. You're holding this, you know, mirror-like ball. You see yourself, but you, you see other things. You see books, you see chair, you see, you know, table, etc., and so on. And so phenomenology is about sort of investigating what you are experiencing. But there has been some confusion about exactly what phenomenology is about. So, Phenomenology is not introspection, okay? And the phenomenology is not concerned with particular content of our individual mind. So I'm aware of like this uh, coffee cup, or I'm aware of this, you know, uh, uh, this device here. That's not, that's not phenomenology in the proper sense, because phenomenology is the systematic study of invariant structure of conscious experience, as well as the uh, genealogy. So, What's the invariant structure? Okay, right now I'm speaking to you, and then there's a center, and then there's a kind of peripheral, and then I'm the object. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm the uh, sort of like subject of this experience, and there are many objects in the audience. Sorry, I mean, should yeah. call it object, but uh, there are object like entities in this uh, environment. So that's the kind of invariant structure they are talking about. Okay. So, moving to a slightly different topic, topic, science of mind, also known as cognitive science. So actually, birth of scientific psychology uh, was in Germany, and they started out as a scientific study of mental state. And then they basically relied on the introspection as a primary means to study mind. But then their enterprise the enterprise failed because there's no agreement across different observers, and then there's no intersubjectively varied uh, disciplined method for investigating mind and, and consciousness. So moving forward, in the early 20th century, there was a rise of behaviorism in North America, which became so dominant, and it basically wiped out everything else. But then in the late 40s and early 50s, or mid 50s, 
There's something called cognitive revolution leading to the development of cognitive science in the 50s, late 50s. So this book called Embodied Mind, which was written by Francisco Barrera and Ivan Thompson and Elena Roche, which was published in 91. And then second edition came out in 2016. It's exactly the same book, no change, but there are new introduction added to the second edition. So if you're gonna buy this book, you should buy second edition. I wouldn't think of this book as a textbook for cognitive science. However, it is still a very good book to trace the history of cognitive science. And the very reason I'm showing you this slide is that because of Francisco Barrera, who was the guy who proposed this idea of neurophenomenology. But he was doing that in the context of this, his larger enterprise that he was dissatisfied with the so-called uh, mainstream conventional cognitive sciences. So he wanted to propose an alternative to that. And then this, in this book, these three also tried to develop what's known as an inactive theory of cognition or an inactive theory of the mind. Okay, so moving on to 91 to 96, Francisco Barrera published this paper called uh, Neurophenomenology, a Methodological Remedy for the Heart Problem. So uh, I skipped uh, 94. In 1994, there was the first meeting called Toward the Science of Consciousness in Tucson. And at that meeting, David Charma, who was a philosopher, or who, who is still a philosopher, he presented his paper called The Hard Problem of Consciousness. And simply stated, hard problem of consciousness, how does consciousness arise from matter? How does consciousness arise from you know, brain processes and so on? And then basically he said, this is something we cannot explain. And then there's a hard problem, and there's an easy problem of, of consciousness, like you know, if you're talking about perception, memory, and so on, you can do a good science. But to talk about consciousness, there's really no way to study. But then, so Barrera's paper, Neurophenology, was a direct attempt to refute Chairman's claim that uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to be done. But then, as you saw in this abstract, it's not what is needed. It's not the new theory or some kind of new idea about how mind works. Instead, it is a new practice, new practice of relating. So the first person perspective and the third person perspective. But this, so this paper was published in 96, but uh, uh, it's sort of like this paper itself didn't seem to have a, uh, any practical sort of uh, useful suggestion for what to do. So for that, um, or before doing that, this is the sort of working hypothesis of neurophenomenology, phenomenological account of structure of experience and their counterpart in cognitive science. And these two things relate to each other through reciprocal constraints. So the, this last part, reciprocal constraints, what does it really mean? So it wasn't clear to me and it also to many other people exactly how we can do this. Now, sorry, I went back. So in uh, 2020, uh, this paper was published by the group of Israeli researchers, Hitchhiker's Guide to Neurophenomenology. Uh, this was published in the Frontier Journal, so it's open access journal. If you remember Hitchhiker's Guide to Neurophenology, and then you can just Google it and you find this paper. So basically, they recount history of neurophenology, but they offer a number of useful suggestions. So my two last two slides um, basically shows two important points I wanted to make. Namely, you talk about phenomenology, but there's a sort of wider range of granularity uh, that, uh, with which you can describe your experience, okay? So you can have a sick phenomenology where you are really aiming to capture the depth of a subtle lived experience, but then you can go the other way and then say you are 
trying to come up with some sort of uh, phenomenal invariant. But then as you see this arrow going from sick phenomenology to seen phenomenology, there's the word naturalization. Naturalization simply means in this context that uh, you are trying to like make your phenomenology accessible to scientific analysis. So one thing I wanted to point out is even if you talk about the experience, you don't have a, like a fixed level of uh, specification. It can move around. And that's important to recognize when you move into next slide. Uh, and I, I think I want to make one quick comment about this working hypothesis of neurophenology. I think Varela misused the word hypothesis. I don't think this is a hypothesis because hypothesis, a model or a theory has to be falsifiable. This, this, this statement is not falsifiable. So it's not the hypothesis. It's a working perspective, working approach of neurophenology. Okay? So, uh, and then in contrast to theory and the hypothesis, the body of approach has to do with how useful they are. How, I mean, how useful they, uh, they might be for whatever you are trying to do. And then uh, in the same Hitchhiker's Guide to uh, Neurophenology, they talk about all these different ways that you can actually bridge between first person account and then third person account or third first person data or third person data. So as you can see, in some cases, arrow is going both ways. In other cases, arrow is going one way. Uh, in last night's talk by Anjan, I think we have seen several examples of this. And even in uh, today's uh, pre uh, presentation earlier, I think there are some examples of how these data from different stream may be used to address some of the question you are trying to answer. So the, my point for uh, showing this is, these are different st strategies right, available to you. So one, one of them is not necessarily better than the other. All of them could be useful, but uh, it depends on exactly what you are trying to do and what kind of resources may be available to you. Okay, so then uh, for this panel, I pose this question. Do you think this uh, framework is meaningful in your area of inquiry? What is the prospect of success? And if this is something that other people are doing, what are the implications for your area uh, of inquiry? And um, these last two questions, excuse me. If you think there's a blind spot in this approach, what would that be? I would be interested in hearing what uh, these three panelists may have to say to this. And if you think neurophenomenology is just a present day manifestation of zeitgeist that is infatuated with subjective time, it's sort of like focusing on inward, you know, then would it survive after several decades or uh, several centuries? And then any other question um, panelists may have. And then one last thing I want to add is that uh, the Barrera's proposal for neurophenomenology wasn't about specifying a new theoretical framework that everyone has to adapt. It was more of a change in scientific practice. Like what are you going to do with your own mind? As a scientist, if your job is to study mind, what are you going to, uh, how are you going to cultivate your own mind for the sake of, sake of understanding your own mind and also other, other people's mind? So it wasn't theory, it was more of a uh, manifesto for changing scientific practice. So with that, I'll end my <laughs> introduction. Sorry, it took longer than. And then uh, I will ask Michael to come to the. So you, you're going to just talk or are you going to use? OK. Well, thank you, Yoshi, for 
giving us this shared perspective. So let's see, two warnings. Uh, I'm not going to talk about sacred architecture today. Um, I'll be giving a talk on that tomorrow, but I will talk about architecture a little while from now. And secondly, I haven't structured this around Yoshi's questions, but I'm grateful for what he told us. Okay. Um, oh, the third thing is I'm not a phenomenologist. Uh, I don't think in phenomenological terms. Um, I am the blind leading the partly sighted. Uh, right. So I have colleagues who are sort of wild about phenomenology. They keep talking about, oh, first person experience and the self and the body and so on. And I often wonder about, about that attitude if carried too far. So let's take an example. You know the field of solipsism. This is the philosophical idea that I am only real and you are figments of my rather tortured imagination. There's a nice anecdote about a, a philosopher who went to Bertrand Russell and, and said that she was very concerned because it was clear to her that solipsism was correct and it pained her that more people did not agree with her. <laughs> and I, I sort of feel at times that's the problem with phenomenology. If you are so wrapped up with your own experience, um, how do you share it with other people? Um, so you tend to go from first person phenomenology to writing papers for, for the third person. And, and so what I, I really need to think about with you is how do we become good phenomenologists? I, I don't know about thick and thin phenomenology, but just think about describing something carefully of your own experience. How many of us really have that vocabulary? I mean, we had Tom telling us about people filling in questionnaires. Uh, as they left the Pantheon. And most of us, I think, would come up with a few telling phrases, but to capture anything like the subtlety of our rich experience. So how do we gain the vocabulary to describe our emotions or our feelings or what we see or what we feel? It's through, in the first place, interacting as a second person. We share experiences first with our caregivers, then with friends and, and other people. Uh, then we begin to read literature and we look at terms used in context or we see videos or we we, and then we build up better tools. But even then, the way we use those terms is very, very subjective. And on the other hand, when we go all the way over to these, what is it, thin universals, it seems to me you have denatured it of all the interesting things about first-person experience. So that's that's the problem. All right. Now, let, let's go to Varela's uh, paper. I knew him when he was a real neuroscientist. Uh, so when he defines neurophenomenology in the paper, it's interesting. He, he says, that's just a shorthand. I have neuropsychoevolutionary phenomenology. And he's seeking, as, as Yoshi said, there's not a, a two-way uh, arrow saying, here's all of experience, here's the brain, and we can reduce everything about experience to what neurons are doing. But in some cases, there's an arrow going this way. In some cases, there's, you know, if you lose part of your brain, then we can make some sense about how your experience of the world will change. And if we talk about visual experience, then we can sort of say, well, here are some of the pathways in the brain that, that support that experience. So let's bring this into the field of architecture. Um, I think the, the foundational book, although it was neglected for many decades, was Richard Neutra's Survival Through Design that came out in, oh, thank you, that came out in 1954. And in this book, he was, on the one hand, a very thoughtful architect uh, relating uh, what the architect did to the way people lived in the world. And a very interesting transition, uh, which is not irrelevant to us, I think, is that he was looking at the transition from the world of the craftsman to the world of mass production and trying to think about how architecture must adapt to that. But his big concern of survival through design was that for the designer to help human survival, they had to know much more about biology, psychology, uh, neuroscience. But that was 1954. In 2008, John Eberhard, published a book called Brain Landscape, but the work that it was based on occurred at the beginning of 2000 when he helped found the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. And one of the interesting things about 
his work was that, well, he had the advantage of 54 more years of neuroscience. And so he really made an effort to bring the neuroscience into play. On the other hand, he had lots of experiments that he suggested to neuroscientists that no neuroscientists would be interested in, but, but never mind. You, you get some sense of the, the problem that we've already seen of when we build these conversations between fields, we're having to, just like I said, we had to, if we want to be really good phenomenologists, we have to learn each other's vocabulary and learn how to approximate the meaning in ways that works for ourselves. Um, a, a term I've used uh, that a, a computer scientist named Carl Hewitt introduced into the uh, artificial intelligence literature was that of a contract. If you're building a large system, then the person working on this part of the system cannot afford to have to know all the details of this part of the system. So you establish a contract which says, if your system performs in such a way that in relation to inputs, internal states, the outputs will behave in this way, then I guarantee that I can build a system that will work to do what you want it to do, so the overall system will work together. And, and so this is part of our interdisciplinary thing, is that I'm a neuroscientist, sort of. Um, I have been in architectural things in my life on occasion, uh, but I can't design a good building, right? But on the other hand, I can get some sense of it. So in my book, When Brains Meet Buildings, I title it not as the reduction of architecture to neuroscience or how the brain explains everything you have to feel in a building, but I call it a conversation between neuroscience and architecture. The whole idea is to say, how can I help the neuroscientists understand enough about architecture to see the difference between a building and the experience and behavior, the action in a building, and what I can do with the, the few parameters I'm looking at in the lab. And conversely, to get the architect to think about how the multifarious uh, conditions that she must consider can be looked at piece by piece, but with an intellectual framework that allows you to put the pieces together and begin to assess that it's not that I reduce everything to one methodology, but I, I can see how. And, and that's why we're having these very nice uh, panels on methods, right? Because from each panelist, they're telling us about a particular part of the puzzle. And the hope is that by the end of it, we will have constructed the whole elephant. Okay, so my own work, just to, to give you a sense, oh, I'm, I have an experiment I wrote out here, all right? So th this issue of uh, the brain in relation to the mind or the conscious in relation to the non-conscious. So here's, here's what I'm going to do, is I want you to now concentrate, concentrate, experience the dynamic patterns in your 10 billion neurons. Experience how these dynamic interactions between 10 billion neurons are mediating action and perception and emotion for you. Got it? <laughs> um, so anybody who, who is prepared now to share with us, uh, you know, just a few million words on the 10 billion neurons, will be all right, this is silly, but I mean, the point I'm making is that phenomenology of conscious experience is the tip of the iceberg. And, and sometimes what you're conscious of is directing you, right? I, I want to get to the coffee break, okay? So there's, your consciousness is then telling you how all those neurons are gonna coordinate your footsteps and, and so on as you move around the space. But other times you, you commit yourself to something and afterwards you say, why did I do that? Because those damn neurons. Well, the, the simplest example is you're in a restaurant and you are you going to have the chicken or the fish? Now, in one case, you might say, well, I had fish for lunch. I'm not going to have the, the fish again. In other cases, you're torn, right? Oh my God, what I would And you make a choice. And it's because what's happening down there, right? Okay. Let me just give you a sample of what I, I bring to the table. Um, I, I've looked at... I started with frog brains. I'll wear my frog tie tomorrow to celebrate this. Um, and, and looking at basic interaction of action and perception. And interestingly, one of the co-authors of the key paper, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, was Umberto Maturana, who was co-author with Varela of his classic work on autopoiesis that laid the basis for, for what you've just heard about. Um, we take data from rats, 
uh, John O'Keefe eventually got the Nobel Prize for the work on place cells, that there are cells that tell you where you are in the brain. Now, what's interesting about that is some people say, oh, that's the GPS in the brain. But my, my humorous reduction is it's like that. Do you know the cartoon? There's a guy and he's lost in the desert and there's a billboard and there's a map on it. And it says, you are here. And that's all it says. And, and so we, we to understand not you are here, but where are you in relation to where you want to go? Then you suddenly have to start bringing in lots of brain systems. But again, I simplify. I don't have a model of 10 billion neurons. I might have a model of thousands of neurons scattered in various areas looking at some particular aspect. And so it goes. I, I was involved with a group that discovered mirror neurons. We had the first computational model that said, don't think of mirror neurons as innately specified. Think of how they grow through experience. And again, when I try to understand what role the mirror neurons might play in, in the way you interact with people, uh, action recognition, uh, empathy, and so on, it was always bringing in systems beyond the mirror to show how they interacted. So as a neuroscientist, I'm continually, uh, I'm a modeler. I, I'm, I'm sort of the opposite of Anjan, right? Whatever you, we say to him, he says, now, can you design an experiment? And I say, have you got any results that will let me constrain a model? Okay. I am burbling on. Um, so let me just say that I've learned from my own, as I work on this, I'm, I'm looking at what the data of other colleagues tell me. I'm trying to go beyond just saying, here are the data to saying, well, what might be the causal underpinnings as I with a brain in a body interact with a social and physical environment. And where I can, I will, in some sense, resort to the first person by saying, can I constrain? No, so can I understand how those results register against my personal experience? So there's the rat running the maze in the lab. Um, what do I have to add to think about the way I navigate around my world and so on? But in the process, I discover lots of things about my own experience that underlie them, just as you didn't access your 10 billion neurons, yet can be conscious that they're influencing how you're reacting to this strange little talk. Okay, so um, I think I stop here by saying that I don't use the term neurophenomenology, but you may remember the character in Moliere who discovered to his delight that he'd been speaking prose all his life. And in a sense, this attempt in my own work to understand the brain in terms of how can I bring it back to, to my own experience of the world, and now in the last 10 years, how do I relate it to architecture? And, and so the closing comment is just to remind ourselves that a building is, is a place in which we act as well as experience. We're not passively just saying, oh, that's a lovely building. Um, we balance off how we behave in it, what we do in it, with how we feel about it, uh, the notion of atmosphere. And that the architect is engaged in this very strange thing, which we might call third-person, first-person phenomenology because they're designing a building not that they will live in or work in or play in, but that other people will. And those people may be neurologically quite different. You're building a kindergarten for a four-year-old uh, as a success, or you're building a home for the demented. I hope you do a good job. Um, but only in some cases are you building a place like your own house where your own first-person phenomenon, so you're trying to simulate the first person phenomenology of third persons who you may not have met for a building that does not yet exist. But I think if we think of that in some sense as the challenge of neurophenomenology for architecture in general, um, and then we can look at the particular demands as we, as we confront sacred architecture. And I hope to continue that story with you tomorrow. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I can give you this one, Yoshi. 
or I can just use this. So uh, we can take one or two quick questions because we have a working memory limitation. So by the time you know third speaker finishes, maybe you don't remember what you want to talk. So okay, uh, that needs microphone. Yeah, it was. I'm switching. Thank you. Thank you. I try to keep it short. Um, thank you for well sharing your thoughts um, and your work. And I was wondering about the whole project of mutual constraint. So it's very clear <clears throat> that in his writing, Francisco Barella, he was not interested in creating some kind of isomorphism between, well, the natural sciences and the phenomenology. It seems quite clear that he was interested in sort of going beyond that. Now, I noticed that in your exercise for us with our billions of neurons trying to, you know, I was actually almost there, but yeah. Um, I think that there is a clear isomorphism in that exercise that exactly what he was trying to go beyond. So I was wondering if you could elaborate uh, on your thoughts on, on mutual constraints in neurophenomenology. Well, the, the point of that exercise was, in fact, to deny an isomorphism, right? It says that you have your phenomenology, but then to ask you to consider the fact that some of what you do, you can sort of attribute to your conscious analysis, and some of it, like the chicken versus fish, is processes that are going on. So the mutual constraint is to say, okay, if I'm using my own experience as one constraint, and I'm looking at the brain activity as another, I will fail if I look for an isomorphism of what I'm thinking about myself now and what my neurons are doing. But more importantly, what I do now depends upon my internal state. That internal state is both determining how I will act, including looking around next. And um, as I in change my interaction with the world, I, I now get new data about the world that is selective. And, and so I'm continually saying, what is going on? And, and this was when I got into the model making, I was saying that specific example of John O'Keefe's work on the place cells. So your first, a lot of sort of uninformed commentary is just to say that, oh, here we've got a, a cell, or actually you need a population, but here's a population of cells that if you know what their activity is, um, it will correlate perfectly with where the rat is in the maze. So you can say that that information is where the rest of the maze. Now, if I want to go on from that, I will then say, yeah, but you know that doesn't tell me where I'm going. So now I need to learn more about the brain to meet that. So the, the just thinking about personal navigation says that I am here is not enough. And so I can go back and forth. Now, the expectation is that some things will yield to that, like certain aspects of visual perception, navigation, and so on. When it comes to the awe one feels in a, in a cathedral, um, then I think that's where I'm a bit more like the, the phenomenologist invariants. I might be able to explain some of the invariants, but even then we've seen how personal differences in their brain are gonna make difference. Am I, am I getting anywhere? You, you don't look happy. Well, uh, um, well, I think we're getting somewhere. Um, but um, I think that there's a clear distinction we need to make here first, um, because it's quite clear as well in Francisco Varela's work, especially working with cellular automata, uh, that he is um, quite aware of the fact that the whole is greater than the sum. And that's why, basically, he quite explicitly writes as well that he's not interested in an isomorphism because we can measure all billions of cells. It would not explain anything about the human experience simply because the whole is greater than the, than, than the sum of the parts. So um, I, I, um, I understand your your point of view here and how you elaborate on it. But what I'm uh, sort of I'm trying to sort of go beyond that because I don't think neurophonology has something to do with a particular person and trying to understand well populations of neurons in relation to some experience. I think of it more as a program. Quite literally, how can you make experiments that are uh, sort of in one end trying to quantify the experience and on the other end uh, trying to well try to come up with some quality of of uh, whatever you are trying to to uh, well either model or measure um so in that sense I, I guess the mutual constraint that i'm questioning here is not in the person itself but in the research program how do we go about creating series of experiments 
that are mutually constraining without uh, talking about I, isomorphism. I, I confess at the start, I'm not an experimentalist, that's your job, you're going to tell us. But uh, let, me, let me take an ex a particular example of the qualia, right, the color. Um, and, and there we have a huge research tradition on trying to get a handle on color. And I can't, I don't think science can ever demonstrate that what I call green doesn't look to you like what you call red, but science has been able to say, we have a complete understanding, you know, not complete, but a very rich understanding. So in the first place, we, we have Young and Co came up with red, green and, and blue tuned cells. So you get some sense of how, and that creates into the, the engineering of pixels for your TV set, but it also gives you an idea of what the input is. Now, on that basis, you could say things like, if I just look at a patch of color, I can take that RGB information and I can come up with a pretty good sense of what that is. But then we have the, the studies where they go out to different tribes and find out they have different color terms. And then you can say, okay, because you're not just, a color is not a, a natural kind, as it were, if you're in a country where you need this color distinction to tell whether a certain kind of fruit is ripe, that may recall, that may drive you to two different color tones. But then you can relate that to how do I look at the RGB spectrum and, and how do I cut it up as a member of a culture whose language is driven in particular ways? And then we can go on to optical effects like, you know, the thing where you place one uh, colored object against different backgrounds and there's the color you will describe changes. And again, in fact, uh, I think the first paper I read by Max Jurana after the, um, this was the land effect, part of what led to Polaroid cameras, but also trying to think a, a fairly good theory of how neural nets could be structured in such a way that your subjective experience of the color would. So I think this is a beautiful example of a research program that takes the qualia and keeps being challenged by more things to come up with new experiments that yield new models. It's, and that's what's crucial to me. It's, it's not just having a, a bunch of data. It's the fact that you can build new models that allow you to predict what will happen. So now you can show people new patterns or new optical illusions and predict what the subjective effect will be. And that's, again, goes to the point that a theory architecture is everything, right? You, you're asking for all manner of feelings, all manner of experience, all manner of behavior. Uh, <laughs> What does religious tradition do to it and all that? So that's where the, 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 the task here is to not simply say, um, oh, give me some good experiments. It's how do you design experiments that are driven by your attempt to understand the whole when you know that you can only look at a fragment? And how are those... In, uh, what's the risk is, is the pace at which people are coming up with new experimental methods where you're coming up with new ways to say, I need this question. Is there some way I can answer it? And people invent new apparatus to get a handle on it. So that's the closest okay. thing can come to making you happy. I think we have to move to second panelist, Sarah Robinson. And then, oh, so I, I don't think you guys are disagreeing, just speaking in slightly different languages, but uh, I think there's a common ground that. Uh, that sort of makes it possible to understand this whole enterprise. But anyway. So um, I generally have a very different take from Michael. So this is going to be a contrast in all the years we've worked together. Um, the big breakthrough for me of the embodied mind was the fact that the mind is not right here. The mind is is can be found in brain body world relations. So if we're going to study consciousness, how do we do that? If we're consciousness sim always in, in interaction. So I think that's the, the real strength of neurophenomenology. So as an architect, experience is, is not part of our training at all. We start from above, and, and this is why we tend to create objects, because the whole the process itself doesn't involve feeling, affect. It involves conceptualization from a distance and looking down. With phenomenology, we're paying attention to our bodies. So the other key thing about neurophenomenology and the and the whole one of the main goals was to 
collapse subject and object and the physical and mental. So um, the mind mind problem is no longer a problem if, if, if physical and mental are related to this structure, this, this consistent structure. So phenomenology is a hugely rich tradition. Husserl is, is, um, is like a bottomless mine of, 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 I think, undigested possibility. And one of his really rich notions, which I, I went into a little bit in my, my recent book, Architecture as a Verb, is his notion of primordial techne. So techne, is, as architects, we're familiar with this Greek word, that how, how to do things, how to make things. So how is it that we already know how to behave in the world? We already, we have all of this non-conscious knowledge, which we're not aware of, which people like Heidegger said, this ready at handness, Varela used the same term. So th there is this shared structure, which I think the, the phenomenologists were trying to get at. Um, and I just wanna read a quote from Merleau-Ponty, who was, who was um, Husserl's student. He said, the union of the soul and the body is not established through an arbitrary decree that unites two mutually exclusive terms, one a subject and the other an object. It is accomplished at each moment in the movement of existence. So to study consciousness, to study mind, if it's constituted by brain body world relationships, Merleau-Ponty liked to use the example of a blind person and their cane how their world is expanded through the tip of their cane. And so our bodies through neuroscience, we know this, are, are open and, and plastic and open to be extended. So this to me seems like a natural turn for architectural education in particular, that we pay more attention to our own experience. And in my talk later, I'm going to be using my experience as kind of the ground for, for speculation, for starting theories. Um, and another, another basic question I want to ask is phenomenology, if we're looking for the structures, the basic structures of, of experience, does phenomenology end in ontology? That is is are we moving towards an understanding of being, of how the world itself is structured by understanding our own experience? That's a general question. And, and Merleau-Ponty himself in his last book, um, The Visible and Invisible works towards this notion of the flesh, where again, this is, I think, an embodiment of what Husserl was saying with his, primordial techne and the and the depth of our of our habitual experience in the world. So to the question of is phenomenology another fad, I, I think it has barely touched um, architecture at all. And there's huge potential there to do so because if we're not testing our, you know, if we're only looking at quote unquote objective information, are, are we missing a whole entire part of experience? And for me, the most inspiring work going on in phenomenology now is Claire Petit Menchen, Men Menchen's work at the Herschel Archives in Paris, where she's developed a very rigorous technique in um, interviewing subjects, which has really enriched a lot of research is on, on architectural experience. So maybe you could say more about that, about her, her work. So if we start from experience in, in architecture, I think we come out with a, a whole different way of doing things, not as an object, but as an interactive um, undertaking. And so I think it's, it's basic, it should be basic to our educational process that we tap into the wisdom of our own experience 
And what we get to when we're talking about non-conscious, it seems like it's it's part of this, this hidden part of our, our minds, but it's actually embedded in our bodily responses. I think that's what we mean by non-conscious behavior. So, and where does that come from? These are all questions of phenomenology. So, take any questions? Any uh, clarifying question? Like you have a question about things that she said and didn't understand, and then let's avoid complicated question. But with maybe uh, we'll, we'll talk more about okay. what you discussed. Okay. So then we'll move to our last panelist, Gordon Graham. Yes, Sarah, from Tom. Not a complicated question. This is such a simple question. Uh, so it's about your last comment about starting with experience in architecture. And I don't know, uh, it would surprise me if there's no experience in architectural education, if that's absent from the process of becoming an architect. And I would just wonder whose experience uh, is playing the role in architectural education uh, or, or what is the place of experience in, I mean, I'd like to know more about your comment uh, because I don't come from that world, so. Well, my education in architecture was really unusual because I, I studied at the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture in, and, and I have to say that that place, it was in Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece, two masterpieces, one in Arizona and one in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And the most important teachers for me were the buildings themselves, which I was learning from through my body, which I realized later because when I was designing, the buildings came back to me through the process of designing. I remembered things. I guess the, the process of design opened up memories that I didn't realize I was absorbing at the time. So all of this information was, was buried somewhere. And I think ph phenomenological investigation can bring it out into more a subtle, you know, more subtle ways than just vision like we've all been criticizing. Okay, thank you. I want to begin with a confession of ignorance. Uh, the term neurophenomenology was entirely new to me before this conference. And th that, uh, in preparation, I read Brainer's paper and also uh, an annotated version of that paper by Michael, which was very helpful. And um, I'm glad to say that as I thought about these things, I found myself gravitating towards the uh, questions that uh, she put up earlier. So I'm going to try and address some of these things and also uh, finally directed uh, towards a, a ta uh, uh, the concept of art and the arts. So as I understand it, as a result of David Chalmers' uh, famous book, uh, the emphasis was on uh, the felt character of experience and how it was uh, impossible to capture this in uh, terms of um, objectified states, be these brain states or something else. And the task in neurophenomenology is to somehow find a way in which the subject of character of experience and the object of character of knowledge and understanding could be brought together. And that is the task and the concept of mutual constraint addresses that task. I'll say something about that in a moment. But first of all, let me just remark um, the American philosopher George Santayana famously said, those who are ignorant of history are destined to repeat it. And I think there is a danger that we should suppose that this is new ground that has never been approached or that has not been explored. This is false. One of my uh, great interests is the 
philosophy of the Scottish Enlightenment that flowed from the uh, work of the famous philosopher David Hume. And Hume thought of himself as a revolutionary, introducing new methods into philosophy. And he did indeed set an agenda for the study of human nature uh, that many, many people followed thereafter. <clears throat> Those who followed Hume also followed him in terms of method. And the methods that he advertised the two dimensions, introspection and what he called experimentation. Of course, he didn't have any of the equipment or anything else to conduct the sort of experiments that are done nowadays. But the <clears throat> structure was not essentially different. On the one hand, there was conscious experience accessed by introspection and description. On the other hand, some kind of objective uh, constraints. And some, not Hume himself so much, but others found these objective constraints in observations about the structure of language uh, and the universal structures of language in terms of uh, grammatical structures. And so they tried to bring these two things into dialogue so that as they described the mind and its workings, uh, they wouldn't just be relying upon personal experience and the purely subjective, they would be checking that against uh, the, as they saw it, uh, the embodied experience of human beings in such things as language and linguistic structures. So this is not new. It's a problem that has been addressed and dealt with, and I might say struggled with over uh, a very long period of time. <clears throat> one of the things to be resisted, I think, is the idea that one side of this uh, is uh, supreme or has supremacy. And I think there is a constant danger, partly because uh, so much of the world is in love with something called the science, <clears throat> that we should think that uh, the objective scientific side of this is in some sense uh, the reality uh, and the experience is purely phenomenal. And I think often in cognitive science, there is a sort of belief that studying the brain or whatever it might be uh, is the real insight into reality. This is how it really is, not how it merely seems. And that seems to be, uh, and I'm not unique in this, that seems to be a great mistake. So uh, just to take uh, uh, an instance, but a very simple instance, we know that there is a general isomorphism between feeling hot and feeling cold and how the thermometer is measuring on the wall. But, and the thermometer on the wall uh, can be quantified and given uh, a figure and all that kind of thing, which maybe we can't do. I mean, people often comment that when you're asked to rank pain on a scale one to 10, how do I begin to do that? So quantifying felt experience is pretty hard. Quantifying measure movement uh, of mercury in a column is pretty easy. And there is some sort of isomorphism between the two. Uh, the mistake is to think, of course, that what's happening in the thermometer is the real thing. And what's happening in me is merely phenomenal. But there is an element of mutual uh, constraint here. Uh, so if I say I'm feeling boiling, I'm boiling, I'm so, I feel so hot, and somebody takes my temperature and say, well, actually, your body temperature isn't that high. Something else is going on here. So that's just a, an example of how these two things can act as mutual constraints. But the mistake is to think uh, that either side, but especially the objective side, is the definitive side. So in answer to at least one of the questions about uh, the, the issue raised, uh, the issue of uh, how uh, to put together, how to connect together uh, the subjective and the objective sides is indeed, I think, to see, to explore how these things act as a mutual uh, constraint. Still, there is the further issue of how do we if I may use the language, transcend the peculiarities, the particularities of um, individualistic experience. 
So there are various ways that people try to do this. And one very obvious way, and we've heard a little bit about this, is to conduct surveys and questionnaires and so on. So you ask a lot of people and then you compute these and put them together in uh, numbers and statistical relationships. Uh, and the question arises, is this actually uh, moving to uh, an objective account of um, experience uh, that eliminates, removes all these subjective peculiarities that distort experience? Because it's just true that subjective conditions distort, distort experience. I, I may not be paying attention because my mind is elsewhere. I may be paying too much attention because I have a fixation and so on and so forth. So subjective experience can definitely be, I put it this way, it's a little odd, too subjective. And so we really want to, you know, and this is the task of uh, phenomenology, uh, the self-appointed task of the philosophy phenomenology, to set itself to distance our understanding from the peculiarities, particularities of subjective experience, while not losing, of course, uh, the fundamental character of experience as experience. And that is uh, the caution, cautionary note that needs to be applied, not just to my simple example of supposing, which I suppose, imagine everybody sees is a mistake, that the movement of um, mercury in a column is the real character of experiencing hot and cold. I, I guess everybody can see that's a mistake. But it is also a mistake to see that generalized experience at least statistically generalized, it's also a mistake. And that's because um, mathematical measures, quantitative measures are abstractions from, they're always abstractions. And in the context we're interested in, they're abstractions from actual experience. And so the issue as I understand it uh, is how to arrive at an understanding or um, a grasp, I'll just use that term, a grasp on the reality of experience that does not either fall into uh, the pit, if I may use such a word, of pure subjectivity, but at the same time does not fall into the error of abstracted quantification. And what I want to suggest, uh, and with this I, I, I say, make a few remarks, but then I'll stop, that this is the uh, remarkable place in which, not exclusively, I don't want to say that, but into which works of art enter. And to use a philosophical term of art, uh, works of art, uh, the term I think comes from Hegel originally, but the work of art presents us with what is called a concrete universal. And that's an interesting term, the concrete universal, because treated in one way, it sounds like a contradiction. How could it be both universal and concrete? But to illustrate the thought behind this, let me just uh, give you, uh, uh, as an example, it, it's, it gets harder and harder when you move into different art forms, but let me just give you an example from the easiest, I suppose, um, which is drama. Consider a character like Othello or Macbeth. What are we to say about that character? Of course, the character uh, is uh, a particular character. Uh, when uh, artists and playwrights and uh, indeed actors and actresses for that matter uh, fail, it is usually when they turn a character into a caricature. So one of the great uh, errors of even quite famous actors and actresses is that whatever the character they play themselves, Michael Caine in my opinion is such an actor, but that's... So to capture the character, is to drop the peculiarity of your own personality. I'm talking about the actor. At the same time, it's not to fall into 
creating a caricature. And that's why it's possible for actors and actresses to give different interpretations. But the interest for us as audience or reader or whatever, the interest for us is not the personality of the actor, nor is it uh, as some kind of stereotype, some generalized kind of character. It is at one and the same time, a specific particular character speaks to a generality or a universality of experience. And so what I want to say is, and uh, I haven't uh, gotten, I won't get to architecture as an art form, but what I want to say is this, <clears throat> Neurophenomenology set itself a problem, and the problem was how to interconnect the subjective experience with the objectivity of understanding and knowledge, and how to do that in a way that observed mutual constraints without, as I uh, am suggesting, falling into either side, the error of thinking that it's the brain is the real thing, or the air of thinking that's the felt experience is the real thing. Uh, and how to combine these things uh, in an enterprise of inquiry uh, that, or understanding that will actually uh, produce or deepen our understanding. And I have no um, recommendations, I'm too ignorant to say anything about how something called scientific method might actually secure that. I just wanted to move to a slightly different context and say, hey, this is an interesting thing. Here is a way of thinking about artworks that sit at the interconnection. And that, if I just uh, allude to something that was mentioned earlier. That is really the thought at the heart of what is called aesthetic cognitivism. It is that works of art have cognit uh, cognitive value. The cognitive value might not be in the straightforward sense knowledge, it might be understanding and depth of understanding, but that works of art does not apply uh, to all works of art. It doesn't apply to all artistic endeavors, but to some, uh, it means that uh, there is cognitive value and the cognitive value arises from the artwork uh, sitting at this intersection between uh, the phenomenological and the uh, objective the subjective and the objective, and combining in, as I say, uh, the artistic concept, the philosophical concept of the concrete universal. Anyway, as I say, it's it's, it's a bit of a job to apply this. I think it can, it can be done eventually, but to apply this to music or architecture, but um, but at least it's starting a starting place. Thank you very much. So then the, uh, maybe three panelists, we can open up a discussion. And is there any question for Gordon? Um, your great quote, Art presents us with a concrete universal. I immediately thought of a Picasso quote where he says, uh, l'art est un mensonge qui nous fait comprendre la vérité. Art is a lie that tells us the truth. Maybe it connects us to the same thing. <laughs> I just have one question about, uh, and this is political, so be careful. Uh, yeah. So what do you think about uh, Templeton Religion Trust picking up aesthetic cognitivism and put it to the empirical te test? Literally, that's what it says in the website. And those actually that apply and get funding are supposed to put that to the test. Uh, the question was, um, the Templeton Religion Trust, to whom we owe this occasion, uh, makes it uh, part of its art seeking understanding program uh, that uh, aesthetic Cognitivism, the 
which is the sort of idea was uh, alluding to, should be put to an empirical test. Now, actually, tomorrow I'm going to, when I give a, a talk, I, I thought uh, I, I should address some fundamental ideas uh, that Sir John Temple, that lay behind Sir John Templeton's enormous uh, bequest three of them. And so I, I will say, try to say something about that, about, about empiricism and reality. But let me just say uh, that um, th I think there is uh, a slight prejudice, and I'm not sure, I, I know why it arose, but I'm not actually sure, to be honest, it was Templeton's own prejudice. But I think there has been a prejudice in, in the working out of the programs that something that would be recognizably scientific to the world at large, which generally means sort of lab-based and um, using a lot of technology and quantification and so on, that that's what's meant by empirical inquiry. And loosening up that um, presumption uh, is something that um, has taken a bit of, of time and it hasn't always. So, uh, Putting, uh, if you like, aesthetic cognitivism to the to an empirical test does not, in my view, mean uh, handing it over to uh, the people who really know about um, 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 IT or uh, computational techniques or um, neuro. Um, neurological states. Now this is, I've had many discussions actually with neuroscientists who think uh, that you're really getting to the heart of things if only you can identify brain images that are, and you know, it's, it's a complex thing, it's a very expensive thing, you need to be very smart to do it. Uh, but in the end, uh, I want to resist the suggestion that this is somehow really seeing how it is. This is the actual access to reality as such, and the rest is mere appearance. And uh, that, I, 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 I think that resisting that impulse on the part of those who are enormously skilled and have enormously sophisticated equipment and so on, resisting that is quite hard work. And I'm not sure, to be honest, that the the people, the advisors to the Templeton, various Templeton Trusts, have always resisted that as I would like to. And let me put my hand up and say, when I do, it often falls on deaf ears. And fair enough, you know, we all have our disagreements. Uh, before opening up, we don't have that much time, but uh, do you guys have any question or uh, any comment for other panelist comment? Well, I, I'd just like to say in relation to, to Sarah's talk that um, I, I think I give more credit to the brain than she does. But um, in my book, I learned from her and called the first chapter, uh, the study of the brain in the body, in the built physical and social environment. And uh, so in a way, whether or not one wants to be a, an inactive, philosopher or whatever, that is, I think, the key point that we would share between us is that it's not that our brain has predisposed abilities that make us Christian or Hindu or that allow us to walk up the stairs. Um, all these things are a result because we find ourselves in different cultural and physical environments that shape us. And if we then want to argue, well, it's only because my synapses did things that I am shaped in that way, which is sort of my opinion, or whether, forget the synapses, honey, which is Sarah's opinion, I, I think that's a pretty good shared lesson. So take it away, Sarah. No, I was just, I, I was just thinking, like making the point about invariance, which is difficult, is, is very difficult to, to find the invariance to me. And I just wanted to share one experience, which was, I was involved in a, it was a symposium on home, the, the meaning of home, and it was in Bucharest. And the most powerful description of home was a student who said, 
in a in an essay. I I know I'm at home if I can get up in the middle of the night and I don't have to turn the light on. That is a profound statement on the on the meaning of home. Our body, his his body, already knew the place he was in without any sort like very little input from his synapses or um, nothing against the brain here. Just saying the body is an extension of our our minds that we that we take for granted too much. And those levels of knowledge can become, are available to us if we have the time and patience to, to dig deeper. Okay, so um, we'll open up to the Q&A from audience. Is there any question, burning question or? A clarifying question or disagreement, objection, anything? Thank you. I just, well, this is a fabulous panel, and I really do appreciate the, the points of view that were shown and the contrast between them. I want to add just that for my particular way of looking at the I focus on essence and to see what connects or actually underpins or from what derives human experience actually is a very rich resource for architecture and design and particularly in the sacred realm. How do you get at essence? Well, do you get it, get it through science? Well, I've read a lot of science and I have found paths to essence from the science. I've read what I now, now find is phenomenological material and find that it's also a path to essence. And that designing with that in mind uh, enriches what we do, particularly because it connects us to the feelings, as Sarah was talking about, the feelings and embodiment and thought of the people we design for. It's one thing made of many parts. You want to say something? Yeah, okay, so so um, I quote Johanny Pallas in my book where he's talking about how James Turrell in, in the way he masters light uh, brings us the experience of thousands or billions of light years. And what I pointed out to Dehani as he was sort of doing this is he was sort of in the, one of his modes. At times he's really supporting neuroscience, at other times he's distinguishing the architect from the science. But in this case, I pointed out to him. But when Tyrell does that, he can only talk about thousands or billions of light years because of science. And so it doesn't mean that we as members of the general public must immerse ourselves in the details of the science. But our experience of the world, the essence, if you will, is continually being enriched. So now we can look at stars and not think about them as parts of a crystal sphere rotating around the Earth. But we can get this, isn't it awesome, genuinely awesome, that light can be coming to us from billions of years ago, um, from the moment of creation of our universe. And you can be as God unfearing as you like, and that's still awesome. Well, I don't think there's an opposition between, there's not a necessary opposition between science. I mean, nobody's, that's what I'm trying to yeah, say. yes. Not knocking science, just saying that the whole point of neurophenomenology is that there's a circularity between scientific method and, and, and the, and the experience of the phenomena that's being studied that that's the point so sarah just mentioned the circularity in human experience and cognitive science uh, that that's the one of the first chapters in the embodied mind i don't work for them so i'm not getting any commission but that book is a good place to start to think about Almost everything you know about science 
that that comes from someone, you know, somebody talking to somebody else. So it's actually applying a second person perspective. So it's, you know, if you think of science as objective and the individual experience is subjective, no, everything starts out as intersubjective uh, endeavor to figure out what's going on. And then uh, kind of like we divide things to objective side and subjective side. But uh, uh, there, there is a perceived conflict between scientific sort of effort and then more of a humanistic oriented activity, you know, including arts. But then uh, uh, I think Barrera's book and then some of the sort of latest development is in cognitive science is trying to bridge this gap between the two tra traditions. And, uh, you know, CP Snow talked about two cultures and there's a deeper divide in our culture. And uh, so that, that divide is kind of loosening up. The distinction is being uh, gradually uh, destroyed or erased and so on. Well, that, that might be true, but I just want to observe a, a, what seems to me an incontestable cultural trend. And that is that um, what falls under or is regarded as falling under the label of science has an authority that other forms of inquiry don't have. There was a time when theology was uh, genuinely regarded as the queen of the sciences, where science is there meant all modes of knowledge. And I think we're kind of um, just uh, not taking seriously the cultural condition in which we find ourselves if we don't accept and don't see that those things that uh, build themselves or are built, first and foremost as natural sciences, to a slightly lesser extent social sciences, have an authority that I, I don't say this with any resentment, but philosophers don't have. And so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have been from time to time part and parcel of moves for philosophers to speak directly in terms of public affairs and public issues and so on. And you can do that and you can do it uh, intelligently and insightfully and lots of people do. It never has the same authority. So I think we, you know, um, it's important to keep trying to explore how, if I put it this way, how the, those things that are sciences are actually quite limited in certain respects. And, uh, and you know, I think this is partly Chalmers' point. There's a whole wealth of mind that things that are correctly called objective scientific methods can't capture. So can't can't capture in principle. He would say. Yeah. So and, and, and I uh, I hesitate to say in principle, but but I think put it this way, there is great conceptual or philosophical, really problematic questions about um, the relationship, and that's why uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the churchlands. Eliminative materialism is the easy way. Just get rid of all this stuff and stick up and stick with brain states. So I think, I think we're, 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 we're on the time. Uh, the reason I, I need we need to have a, a sharp cut because we have lunch. And uh, the only thing I, I would add is that uh, CP is now, as you, as you probably remember, or some of us know, in 1959, and uh, the famous uh, two cultures, right? The two cultures that that's exactly the point you're making. I'm also making that there is nothing new, really. Uh, the humanities and the hard science and this conversation have been happening ever since with the rise of uh, power of, of, of one over the other. Uh, so that's uh, the, this is a hard problem. This is the hard problem, how we reconcile and, and with constraint bring these two ways of obviously of consciousness, you know, one a quantifiable consciousness, the other qualifying consciousness. Anyway, so uh, thank you for your attention. 